Good afternoon, everyone. This is George Orling from HDSA. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of the HDSA Research Webinar Series. Um, <clears throat> before I introduce our speakers, for those that are potentially new to this format, just wanted to walk through um, some of the ways you can ask questions of, of Dr. Wild and Lauren Byrne today. Um, at any point during their presentation, on the menu bar on the right-hand side of your screen, you should be able to see something that says questions, highlighted here in the red box. Um, just type your question at any point, and at the end of their presentation, we'll ask those questions um, on your behalf to uh, Dr. Wild and Lauren. Um, we'll also, we are also recording this webinar for those that may have to dial, uh, hang up, or know folks that wanted to attend uh, and hear what they had to say but, but couldn't make it live, no worries, we are recording it, and uh, we'll archive this at hdsa.org backslash research webinar, um, as well as on our, our YouTube channel, which can be found on our website by going on and clicking the YouTube uh, icon that's grayed out here and highlighted with the red oval. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Dr. Leora Fox. Leora, do you want to to say a quick hello, you'll be hearing a lot more from Leora in future research webinars, but she's our, our newest uh, hire here at HDSA, and I thought I'd just turn it over to you, Leora, to do a brief hello and, and state where you're from and what brought you to HDSA. Sure, yes. Hi, I'm Leora. I, um, I was an HD researcher and science writer previously before joining HDSA, and um, I'm working closely with George, and you may be hearing my voice on webinars um, or at events in the future, so um, I'm glad to be here as well, and I'll turn it back to George. Thanks, Leora. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Ed Wild is a Principal Research Fellow at the Univers uh, University College of London Institute of Neurology uh, and is a Consultant Neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Uh, he's been uh, an HD researcher for many years focusing on biomarkers and new treatments for HD. Um, and uh, many of you may know him from his, with uh, Jeff Carroll where they present uh, a fantastic overview at each of our HDSA uh, conventions, uh, a year, their year in review of HD research. Uh, he's also with Jeff Carroll, the co-founder of HD Buzz, which is a fantastic online resource for uh, understanding the deep science that they're going to present today in a language that's uh, uh, easily understood. Joining Ed is Lauren, Lauren Byrne. Lauren is a, a research assistant and an, a PhD student with Dr. Wild, um, working on the HDCSF study. She studied biology at the Imperial College of London, graduating in 2014, and completed her master's degree in 2015 on translational neurology at UCL Institute of Neurology. Um, she's working on biofluid biomarkers uh, that can be used to track disease onset and progression, of, progression in blood and the spinal fluid of patients with HD. They're both here to speak about their recent exciting paper in Lancet Neurology, uh, and the title of their presentation today is, What's the Deal with Neurofilament? A Blood Test that Predicts HD Progression. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ed, and Lauren. Thanks, George, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here, wherever here is for you. I'm just going to try and bring up my slides, and I think that that should have worked. George will let me know if it didn't, but hopefully you can see my slides now. So I'm here in London with Lauren. Hi. That was Lauren. Um, and uh, we're uh, very excited to be able to present this webinar dealing slightly unusually for me uh, with our own work. Normally when I talk to an HDSA audience, it's presenting everything that's happening in the world. So. Um, uh, hopefully I, I can do a decent job with Lauren of talking about work that we did ourselves. So this is us. Uh, this is not a photo taken today. This was a, a, a recent webinar we did uh, uh, for scientists on this topic. Um, I'm Ed, that's Lauren, and Riley, the uh, chihuahua, is sadly not joining us today. Uh, but feel free to imagine a small white dog mm -hmm. if that helps you get through the science. So um, we're going to talk about this uh, paper and the science behind it, um, but really, as with everything in HD, the story goes back to the gene, the Huntington's disease gene, 
um, which, as you may know, was discovered in 1993 after a huge worldwide effort to um, identify it. And what changed overnight in 1993 was that suddenly we knew the cause of every case of Huntington's disease. And also that there's something special about the genetic change or mutation that causes HD, namely that um, the gene uh, that causes it is a recipe for this protein. The protein is the blue potato looking thing on the right. Um, and uh, the gene made from DNA is a recipe for that protein. And in people who develop HD, there are too many CAGs. So we use these letters to represent the code of the gene. And in uh, people who get HD, there are too many of these, or more than the normal amount of CAGs. So um, in each of those CAGs, when the, uh, when the gene is being used or read by the cell, um, each one corresponds to a building block that we call glutamine. And so the number of CAGs in your gene corresponds to the number of glutamines that you end up with in your protein. And as a result, um, people who inherit an abnormal or expanded copy of that gene produce two flavors of Huntington protein. The blue one at the top we call wild type. It is not named after me. Uh, don't be fooled into thinking that it might be. Uh, and you get that one if you have 35 or fewer CAGs. If you have 36 or more, your cells also produce this dangerous or harmful protein that we call mutant Huntington. And that protein is the cause of all of the damage in HD. Um, uh, that was discovered 24 years ago now, and in, the, in that period there have been nearly 100 clinical trials of treatments to either control the symptoms of HD or to um, sort of shoot for the moon in a way and, and try and either prevent or reverse or cure Huntington's disease. So far, nothing has worked, but that was also true of climbing Everest until someone actually did it. So we continue to believe more than ever that this is something that is possible. And a good example of the kind of thing that we're doing now to um, try and uh, make a real difference to the progression of HD is the idea of gene silencing or Huntington lowering. And again, this comes back to the, the idea that a gene is a recipe for a protein. Um, and if this protein is harmful, then if we could make there be less of it, then that would probably be helpful. But the story's a little bit more complicated than that. There's this message molecule in the middle. And so there are a, a family of drugs that are made from DNA or similar mole molecules. And a couple, there are actually two of them in clinical trials now. One is from Ionis Pharmaceuticals and the other is from WAVE. And basically the idea is that they stick to the message molecule in the middle and the cell then deletes the message and the protein doesn't get made. And so for the first time in a long time, we have a new way of tackling Huntington's disease that actually addresses the problem at its very cause, the mutant gene and its protein. Um, and we have every reason to believe, and so far all of the uh, public announcements from the trial have suggested that that is going extremely well, and we're all very uh, excited about it. There's a problem though. It's a kind of a, a good problem, but it is a problem. And I'm gonna use my friend, Jeff Carroll, to demonstrate the problem. So this is Jeff. He just turned 40, uh, and here he is eating um, what I would call a nice lolly, but I guess what most of you guys would call a popsicle. Um, I did, so Jeff, it is, it's well known among people who know him, and he doesn't mind people knowing. It's well known that Jeff has uh, inherited the HD mutation from his mum, or his mom, as you would say. Um, so at some point, Jeff, unless we can do something about it, Jeff will develop HD. What we would like to do is take Jeff now, when he's completely healthy, and give him a drug like the one that we're testing that will hopefully make a big difference and then see him again in five years or even 10 years and see that he's completely fine, that he hasn't changed at all. I mean, he'll almost certainly look much worse than he currently does, but that won't be anything to do with HD. <laughs> the <tr> Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> the trouble is, um, if he looks the same five years from now, it will be impossible for us to know from the outside whether that's because the drug is working or because HD is very variable, whether actually he was going to be fine anyway. You know, he may not be destined to get HD until he's 50 or 55, in which case he would look the same anyway. So that makes testing these drugs, particularly to prevent HD, really, really difficult. Even if we have a drug that we think is very likely to work, how do we test it? How do we open up Jeff's brain and look inside it and see whether the drug is actually achieving what it's meant to do, which is protecting his brain cells? I've asked him and he won't let us 
saw off the top of his head and scoop out his brain. So we're going to have to think of something else. And that's where this idea of biomarkers comes in. Thankfully, people much cleverer than me have been thinking about this for a long time. So um, the, a biomarker is basically, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start with the FDA definition of a biomarker, and then I'm going to come on to my own definition, which I think is better. This is the FDA definition. A biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or biological responses to a therapeutic intervention. Your tax dollars at work there, turning a very simple concept into something that nobody understands. This is my definition. It is in the form of a haiku, which is a Japanese poem. Um, and you're, you're welcome to check out the syllable count, but I th think you'll find it works. Biomarkers are measures that tell you something if you are careful. So blood pressure is a good example of a biomarker. Um, you can measure it. It's quite easy to measure and it can be measured quite reliably. And it tells us something about uh, what the pressure is inside your blood vessels, but it also tells us something about your future chance of developing heart disease and strokes. And we also know that lowering your blood pressure, as long as we don't lower it too much, um, uh, in the right way, produces a much improved future for people who had high blood pressure previously. So blood pressure going from high to normal, we know now from studying heart disease for in thousands of people that that predicts a much better outcome for those people. But you have to be careful because in the case of blood pressure, for instance, if you lower it from normal to too low, that can be bad for the brain. So you really have to be careful about what it is you're measuring and you have to study these things very carefully. You can't, you mustn't make dangerous assumptions about biomarkers. So what we need in order to figure out whether we are saving Jeff's brain is a biomarker. And at this point, I like to switch to an analogy that involves a river. And this river is the, the flow of um, damage in Huntington's disease. So at some point, people who have the mutation that causes HD will develop signs and symptoms of HD. And those are quite complicated, which is why at this point, the river runs in parallel. It's got several different streams running in parallel. And if you want to sort of get a complete idea of what the river looks like, you have to look at behavioral symptoms, movement problems, and weight loss, and sleep problems, and all sorts of things. The advantage we have in HD is that we know the source of the river, right? It's this genetic mutation, and it's this mutant protein that, that damages our brain cells, our neurons. However, as soon as that protein is produced, the river gets very complicated because this protein causes damage to cells or makes cells unhappy in lots of complex ways. Things going wrong. Um, for a little bit further downstream, though, everything kind of merges into one again when the cells start to malfunction or when they start to perform less efficiently than they were performing before. And at some point, the, the, the rate at which our neurons die goes higher than normal and that's you know that's what causes uh, progression in Huntington's disease especially later on. So the idea of um, the river is that um, I'm going to go back one slide is that you could you could look at the river or measure the river at any point but perhaps the most useful places to look at it are these places where everyone's behaving everyone's river is doing the same thing so that would be here when we're looking at damage to neurons and also back here when we look at the source of the river and one of the most important tasks that we faced until quite recently in HD was that we had these drugs coming to clinical trials that we hoped would lower the level of the protein, this guy, but we didn't have any means of measuring whether that had um, worked until uh, a couple of years ago when um, a company called Singulex developed a machine that basically um, shines a very bright laser onto protein molecules. And if you stick the right antibodies onto those protein molecules, then when they pass through the laser interrogation chamber, you get a flash of light and uh, you can count the flashes and however many flashes you get tells you how much protein was in the original sample. And for the first time, that new machine enabled us to um, calculate how much Huntington protein, how much of the mutant Huntington protein was actually floating around in the cerebrospinal fluid, which is this clear fluid that surrounds the brain. Um, and what we showed was that the, the that we first of all we were able to detect how much protein was there in uh, patients with HD, but we didn't find any mutant protein in in control subjects, people who don't have the mutation. And that's so that's a, a very well performing um, measurement platform. But also we found that the level went up as people's HD progressed from pre-manifest to manifest.
So pre-manifest is people who don't have symptoms, basically. And this was published a couple of years ago, and it was kind of just in the nick of time, because it was only about six months later that we gave the first doses in the gene silencing trial, or the Huntington lowering trial. And now we're reaching the end of that trial, measuring the mutant protein level in spinal fluid using this um, measurement system is going to be a really important test of whether the drug is actually hitting its target and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so that's a good example, I think, of progress that we've made in biomarkers, um, and that's kind of in the bank. Um, that's a that's a measurement system that we have. However, there's a difference between lowering mutant Huntington protein and actually making a difference to Huntington's disease. So one of the possible things that could happen is that we might lower the mutant protein and then people don't actually get better or it doesn't actually prevent HD. We hope that won't happen, but we ideally we'd like to be able to show that the drug is not only hitting its target, but it's also doing something that we believe is healthy for our neurons. Um, if we can show, for instance, that the neurons are less damaged than before or that the rate of damage has slowed down, it, that will give us the courage that we need to carry on with this quest. Um, and the, the drug companies I speak to agree that that would be a useful thing. So enter uh, a protein called neurofilament. So the neurofilament, you can see in the background of this slide, there's sort of gray streaks all over the place. And that's a, that's a neuron, a brain cell that's been um, stained so that the neurofilament protein inside it looks green. So neurofilament is basically everywhere in neurons. It's kind of like the bricks and mortar that make up our neurons. It's particularly um, found inside the long um, wire-like uh, extensions of our neurons. We call those axons, and those are the kind of insulated wires that carry messages through our brains. Um, as long ago as 2008, um, a team uh, measured neurofilament in the in the cerebrospinal fluid of some Huntington's disease patients. And um, they, what they found was that the level was increased. So these green squares are the value that the amount of neurofilament that they found in the spinal fluid of um, HD patients. And the yellow ones are the levels that they found in um, healthy control people. And actually we did it again when we published our mutant Huntington measurement test. We not only uh, measured mutant Huntington, but we also looked in the spinal fluid to see whether the level of uh, neurofilament was increased. And we found that it was, and also that the level of neurofilament was very closely linked to the level of mutant Huntington. And to us, that, that means that the mutant Huntington we're finding is probably coming from neurons. And again, that was very um, encouraging because that's really what we want to measure. We want to measure whether, neuro, whether mutant Huntington is coming from neurons. But if we can save neurons, it's possible that less neurofilament might be released. So this is sort of telling us, as we think that these are that our neurons are slightly unhappy or that they're slightly damaged. It doesn't mean that they are dead. Um, and actually, it probably tells us that something's going on that we should be able to rescue. So that's great. And measuring neurofilament in spinal fluid is certainly useful. But ideally, we'd like to not have to stab people in the back to be able to figure out what's happening inside their brains. Um, thankfully, time goes on and technology improves, and this huge machine uh, called a Quantarix Samoa machine came onto the market. Um, the machine, weirdly enough, is called the HD1 analyzer, even though it, when it was invented, it had nothing to do with Huntington's disease. And this is my friend and colleague, Henrik Zetterberg, who is from Sweden, and he invented a uh, way of using this machine to measure neurofilament levels not in spinal fluid, but in blood. So the level in blood is very, very, very low. Um, and using a normal measurement system, um, we wouldn't be able to detect it at all. But so Henrik invented this way of measuring neurofilament in much lower concentrations in blood. And um, other people did work in other diseases long before we, uh, well, not long, about a year before, actually. A year is a long time in science. <laughs> before we were able to, um, do it for ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. What this is is a, is a graph showing what happens if you have a brain operation. So they measured the neurofilament level in blood at the beginning, at month zero, and then they these were people who needed to have a brain operation anyway. They had the operation done, and then they closed up their brains. And what they found was that a month afterwards, the level in neuro, of neurofilament in the blood had gone up by about three or four times. And then after three and six months, it settled back down to normal, suggesting that this is probably, even though you're measuring it in blood, it probably is measuring 
neurofilament that's released from brain cells. So that was cool. And this is another graph from a, a, a clinical trial in multiple sclerosis. Basically, the box, the, the, the height of this um, line is the average level of neurofilament in blood in people with multiple sclerosis who didn't get a treatment. And then the line on the right, the box on the right, this horizontal line in the middle, shows that the ones who did get the treatment that's effective, a drug called fingolimod, their neurofilament level a year later was much lower. It was less than half the level that was seen in the people who had uh, received the placebo treatment, i.e. Their, their MS had remained untreated. So what this tells us is that not only is the level increased in brain diseases, but also if you, if you have a successful treatment, you can expect the level to fall. And hopefully it would fall more quickly um, if we had a really good treatment for HD. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Lauren, and, and she's going to explain what we did to bring neurofilament into Huntington's disease. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, very excited to have the chance to share our work. Um, and as you can tell from Ed, this is, we think, is pretty important stuff, and hopefully we'll have a help with uh, the future clinical trials in HD. So we looked at neurofilament in this study called Track HD. So some of you might have heard of it, but it took place in a few sites in, in Europe and in uh, Canada and was headed by Sarah Tabrizzi at UCL. Um, and the whole point of the study was to um, follow um, patients and, and people who carry the gene for Huntington's disease and uh, do a, a battery of um, assessments to try and find better biomarkers for Huntington's disease. And these included things like MRI scans, so brain images, um, quantitative motor and cognitive or thinking tests, as well as some psychiatric assessments. But they also took blood samples. And it was this uh, study took place um, from 2008 to 2011. And really, um, the blood samples haven't uh, been much use until now. So we measured um, the the first, uh, the baseline uh, blood samples, so the blood at the start, um, the neurofilament levels then, and the, then the follow-up at the end of the uh, year three. And what we found was when we compared levels, these are the levels of neurofilament in blood in controls, so people that don't have the HD gene. And then we, um, you can see with all stages of HD, it increases, most importantly, um, these increase with HD and, um, and more interestingly, we see this early pre-manifest stage. So these are people far, far from onset, so over 10 years, um, which is no other biofluid biomarker has been able to show any of this early changes. Why is this exciting? Um, obviously, you know, we don't want things changing this early, but this tells us that something about our, our brain cells are unhappy, but at a stage where there's, they're not dying, they're at a stage that they're definitely um, potentially savable. Or what word is that? Savable. Savable. Or <laughs> but not salvable. Yeah. We could hopefully, um, they're the perfect cells that we want to target and hopefully protect and, and improve and, and get better. Um, so that's why it's important to have these early markers that when we do have a disease modifying treatment, we can treat at this stage and hopefully. So. And what are these? What are all these numbers where it says p less than 0. 0.0001? Why does that make us excited? Well, um, <laughs> so <laughs> using statistics, um, uh, we've shown that each of these groups are significantly higher um, uh, than than normal levels, and each of these subgroups um, are of of HD are also different, uh, from different other, for each yeah. other. So with, with fancy like, stats to prove right. it. <laughs> the lower the p-value, so the more zeros there are after the decimal point, the more certain we are that this is a real finding rather than something that's just thrown up by chance. And that, that p with the, the less than sign means it's very, very low. So it, mm -hmm. we just couldn't measure it any lower than 0.001. Okay. Um, so then we wanted, we, so with HD, you know it's caused by this gene and these um, you've heard about CAG repeats, as Ed mentioned earlier. This um, allows for us to do quite interesting research in, in, in HD. And we've um, a lot of research has shown that there's a relationship with the CAG level and different symptoms of, of HD. So we looked at um, this the NFL with age. And you can see with controls, there's a, a steady increase with age in, in these levels. But when you look at different levels of CAG and as they increase you see a, 
a really striking relationship with um, with neurofilm and um, which um, I don't know if everybody. Yeah, so the, the, basically the higher the CAG in the gene, the earlier the neurofilament level seems to rise in blood and the more steeply it rises, the more quickly it rises with age. And this really mirrors what we see in terms of the relationship between CAG and clinical onset of HT. So if your CAG repeat is big, your, your HD is likely to begin earlier and progress more quickly. Now, obviously, there's a lot of variability between people. So this is not, um, this is not something that we could use to give individual people information about their likely future prospects. But what it really does is, is it ties this blood test. Remember, this is a brain protein floating around in blood. It ties that blood test result right back to the length of the HD mutation inside those brain cells. And really when we see this kind of relationship for a biomarker, um, we're in, HD is a very privileged position because in most diseases you haven't got a gene. And if you have a gene, you don't, you don't have this ability to look at the relationship between the severity of the mutation, if you like, and the level of the biomarker. So this was really kind of um, an awesome link between the gene and the biomarker especially if you cl if you clean it up by taking away all the data points um, and putting numbers on it. Looks very pretty. Um, and we liked it so much, we made t-shirts. It's a prime example why you shouldn't joke in front of Ed Wild. Um, he will make it happen. And if everybody recognizes Nancy Wexler in the middle, she also liked the figure very much. She liked it, actually. She liked the picture. I don't have the photo of me taking off my t-shirt, but she liked it so much that she uh, insisted that I give her my t-shirt which I was pleased to do. But I think the main thing is that it, it's showing that neurofilament really relates to something about HD pathology, the core HD pathology. What's pathology Lauren? Sorry. <laughs> Brain stuff. Brain stuff or the things that are going wrong in right. HD. Um, so back to the next thing that we looked at. So for a biomarker as I had mentioned it's really important if we could have, take a measurement that can tell us something about how someone's going to progress or give give us some kind of prediction or prognosis for someone. So we looked at pre-manifest people, so people that have the gene but didn't have symptoms at the start of the study, and then uh, looked at their measure, their levels of neurofilament at that stage and seeing which of those individuals progressed to manifest or started to get symptoms of Huntington's in the three years of the study. And what we saw is the people that did progress had significantly higher more uh, higher neurofilament in their blood at the start of the study. And this is a single measurement of neurofilament at the start. Um, and when we we in science, it's good to we like to um, adjust in, in HG for this age and CAG relationship, as we just shown, because it might tell us that this biomarker that we're looking at has something more to tell us that we already know from the CAG alone. Um, and when we do, it was still significant. When we do adjust for this, it was still significant. So that's basically like taking all of these people who were pre-manifest and making the statistics sort of pretend that they all had the same age and same CAG at the beginning, um, and then look at whether neurofilament still was able to tell us something about what happened to those people over the next few years. So that was cool. Yeah. Um, and similarly, we wanted to look at some of the clinical features or some of the measures that were really, um, that were found to be really important in predicting progression from the track HD study, which um, was these brain images or um, we call um, atrophy in HD. So atrophy is basically you take an image at one time of the brain and then another time and you use the, the time apart to calculate a kind of rate or difference a rate of change between those times and these um, er we can um, draw around different areas of the brain to see if different areas change at different rates so the caudate is a particular area of the brain that's affected a lot in Huntington's disease and has been shown to be the earliest um, affected uh, area of the brain and we see a, an association with a, the baseline or the, the first um, neurofilament measurement and how that changes over time, as well as whole brains, the whole um, atrophy rate or um, uh, sh brain shrinkage, um, as well as white matter. So white matter is 
the, these connections in the brain. Ed mentioned those wires that are um, that connect all of our neurons to other neurons and are the things send in information. So we saw with these a single measurement of neurofilament at the start was um, strongly associated or related to how the brain changed over the three years which we thought was very exciting. It also was related to clinical features in the disease. So we have the two cognitive tests, this symbol digit score and the Stroop word reading. Cognitive test just means thinking tests. <laughs> and you might know some of these, like the, so the symbol digit one is like the code breaking test where you, you get a series of symbols and each of them corresponds to a number. And then you have to kind of crack a code of symbols. And Anyone who does enroll, I just did my enroll visit uh, before coming here. Um, the, these are the kind of tests that you do in clinic and things like that. Um, and then TFC just stands for the functional capacity score. So it's it's one of the, the scores used in the clinic to kind of assess how well you can do your finances or work or um, daily kind of tasks. Um, and, and all these were associated, uh, the change in these were all associated with the initial level of neurofilament in the blood. Or to flip that around, your neurofilament <laughs> level today predicted overall in this group of people the neurofilament level today predicted what how much they would change over the next three years um and we we mentioned that this is a, a blood protein and we think that this is showing something about what's happening in the brain and in, in the central nervous system um but you know you always have to do tests and kind of figure this out so we compared the levels in a separate study a group of people um in the csf or cerebral spinal fluid and and plasma, the blood levels, and we saw that they were strongly associated with each other. So, given us some evidence that the, this this blood measure is really telling us something about what's going on inside the brain. And when Lauren says associated with, what she means is that when one rises, the other one rises. So, if someone has a high level in their CSF, in their basically in their nervous system, they will also have a high level in their plasma. But if you look at the numbers, you'll see that, like, if you look at the two thousand value here. 2000 NFL value in your CSF is only 35 in your plasma, which means that there's actually way more of the neurofilament in the CSF than there is in the plasma in the blood. Uh, and that is another clue that this protein is definitely coming from the brain and then leaking out into the blood. Um, and this is some new data from a, our new study, the study that I work on, HCCSF, and it, we've already shown some replication of what we've seen um, in this, this study. So that's to come. Right, so this is the second time that we've looked at the relationship of neurofilament in plasma and in blood and CSF, but this time it's a much bigger group of patients, so we call that replication in science, and if you can replicate your data, it just means you do the same thing again and you get the same result, um, and it's, it's it, it, obviously it means it's more likely that what you found was a real thing. So in summary, this plasma or blood, um, NFL or neurofilament, increases with HD progression and we see the striking relationship with CAG repeat length um, and we see a prediction from neurofilament with onset and brain atrophy or shrinkage um, as well as progression and we saw that these blood and, and cerebrospinal fluid levels are closely linked. So why we're really excited, just to give you another analogy, because um, we like analogies in Team Wild. We do. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to, to um, assessing whether drugs working or if, if a drug is really slowing down progress and progression of Huntington's disease and, and putting the brakes on HD. We have different ways of, of we could we could try and measure this. So if you take a brain volume, which in other words is a, a picture of the brain or a brain scan from a brain scan, um, it's almost like measuring how far someone's come or a distance traveled in the way same way as an odometer would. A kilometer is like a mile but slightly smaller by the way. <laughs> Um, and I mentioned brain atrophy before is like taking two images um, at, different, at different times apart in the same way a speed camera would it, as a way to measure um, the speed you're going or the rate of how something's happening. But when we took a look at neurofilament, we think um, one single measurement is telling us about an ongoing or the current speed of, of damage in, of the neurons or current rate of, of, of neur the neuron, neuronal damage in the same way as a speedometer would. And I know if I was trying to test if my bricks were working, I know the first place I would look. So we've published this data, um, but I'm sure you would probably like to read a much more um, readable version. So I would definitely um, send you to HD Buzz. Um, this, um, 
is a summary of the current the paper and all the results. Um, it's worth mentioning also that the paper itself is uh, open access. So mm -hmm. if you feel like um, reading it, you absolutely can. You can look at all the graphs we've shown you and a, a ton of other graphs as well. Um, and Except for they ruined our nice graph. They put the numbers in the wrong, not the wrong place, but the, the, the version that ended up being published was slightly less pretty than it could have been. But what can you do? Like they are only professional graphic designers after all. Whatever. Um, <laughs> so this is cool. And when, you know, we certainly uh, popped open some champagne when we uh, got these results published but you know the real question is like where do we go from here and how do we actually make this useful I mean it, the good news is this it is already useful um, it, this this neurofilament measurement you know if I were running a clinical trial in HD that of a drug that I think is going to slow down progression or prevent HD I would definitely be measuring neurofilament certainly in blood samples and if I was sticking needles in people's backs I would also recommend measuring it in, in the CSF the spinal fluid um, so any uh, uh, company that wants to do that can do it already. Um, this this assay, this platform for measuring neurofilament is pretty easy to get hold of. You can send samples to Henrik, you can send them to us, or you can pay a commercial company to measure the neurofilament level. And so really this is kind of out there in the world doing its thing and being useful. For us as the HD community, I think it's or the research community, the research bit of the HD community. Um, I think that our responsibility is now to try and quickly figure out what neurofilament means in real life. In other words, things like if the level falls after a treatment, does that mean that you know the, the person will end up better or that you will delay their onset of HD? What about in all of the animal models of HD? Do they have an increased neurofilament level or um, do they actually not show neurofilament? increases. If they don't, it's not the end of the world, but it means that you, you, you might want to take a, with a pinch of salt claims where those animals whose brains don't produce neurofilament and throw it out into the blood uh, have been said to sort of have been cured in experiments. So you know, in, in other words, we can sort of try and figure out which bits of this human um, thing of HD that we've discovered. Let me put this another way. Yes. We've discovered a thing that's definitely true of human Huntington's disease. If an, if an animal model shows the same feature, then that's a gold star for that animal model. <laughs> it doesn't mean all the others are useless, it just means that we can't really use those animals to model this particular feature of Huntington's disease. And it might help the progress of trials because before we test anything in, 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 in humans, we have to get really good evidence mm. from these animal models. So if we have a better animal model, we'll hopefully get rid of bad drugs and know more about good drugs. So the bottom line is we're doing this thing called the Influx HD Consortium and that what that basically involves is getting as many samples that are already out there in the world. So from blood samples from humans, uh, trial um, studies like track on HD, predict HD, the kids HD study that's happening in Iowa and our study in UCL called HD YAS, which is the, sorry, HD YAS, <laughs> which is the young adult study. Basically, if we combine all of these blood samples, we'll get a really clear idea um, of how neurofilament changes from the very earliest stages of HD, like way 20, 30, 40 years before symptoms, right up until the point where people get symptoms. And then if we also combine that with all of the animal models of HD, the mice, the sheep, the pigs, there aren't elephant models of, or dolphin <laughs> models of HD, you'll be pleased to hear, but this is, you get the general idea. Um, and so that's the idea. We're kind of working hard to try and figure out what all of this means. That, I suppose, makes me Russell Crowe, um, but uh, I won't dwell on that image. Um, so far, here's what we've seen um, in one uh, collaboration. This was done by Maria Bjorkvist, um, who is in Sweden, and she looked in these R62 mice. This was the first ever mouse model of Huntington's disease, and it's a mouse that gets sick really quickly. So within about four or five months of being born, these mice have got really severe uh, symptoms similar to Huntington's disease and when they have severe symptoms what we showed is that in the CSF in the spinal fluid of these mice the neurofilament level was increased like we saw in humans and the same was true in the blood um, the level in blood was also increased and once again just like we saw in humans this, the level in CSF uh, reflects the level in, in blood but the level in CSF is much higher so that was cool that, that this mouse model when the mice have quite bad symptoms performs exactly the same as the human um, the humans that we studied um, while we're on the subject of developing 
uh, new tests and new measurement platforms, it's worth mentioning that we are now trying to develop an even better version of the Mutant Huntington measuring system using this big new shiny machine. Uh, and we don't know yet, but what we hope is that by um, converting that measurement system to work on this machine, we, we might be able to get the, get the test even more accurate and more sensitive. And that will be very helpful when it comes to lowering uh, Huntington uh, protein or, hope, or trying to anyway within the trials. And how can you guys help? Well, right now, um, my, the message I always have for all HD families is join Enroll HD. This is an example of how observational trials like Track HD, Predict, and Enroll can really, really produce the kind of results that um, make a difference to HD drug development, but also they're the kind of thing that nobody knew would happen when these studies were first designed. When we, in, when we developed Track HD, it was about 2007, we hadn't heard of neurofilament. We certainly didn't know that one day it would be possible to measure it in blood using the samples that we were collecting. So you kind of pay it forward by taking part in these trials. And an important example to me is the HD Clarity study. This is built on the Enroll HD platform. So if you're in Enroll HD, then you may be asked to join HD Clarity. And it's basically a, um, a, a cerebrospinal fluid project where um, people are invited to do donate CSF by having a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. Um, and we use that fluid and the blood samples that we collect and all of the data that's already been collected in Enroll HD to study Huntington's disease and to make um, our efforts to find biomarkers more likely to succeed and to then use, get those biomarkers ready to use for testing drugs. Um, it's very much up and running in Canada, the UK and Germany. We have broken the US. We have one site up and running uh, in the US, which is um, Professor Chris Ross in Johns Hopkins. Um, the Wake Forest site uh, run by Francis Walker um, is has had their initiation visit, so they will hopefully be up and running within a month or so. And we have actually about a dozen different sites in the USA, um, which are um, going through the process of site setup. So this will, uh, and um, if you're near a site um, in the US uh, in the future, you'll be able to look at hdtrialfinder.org, which is the HDSA's clinical trial platform, um, and it will tell you where your nearest HD Clarity site is. So. Lots of scientists to thank, and their names are written here. Um, but more importantly, we'd like to thank all of the patients uh, and HD family members and controls who have donated blood and CSF and their time um, to enable us to make this biomarker breakthrough that we hope will make a big difference um, in the future for HD families. Uh, I think that's all we need to say, but we're happy to take questions until you don't have any more questions. Thanks. Thanks, Ed and Lauren. Um, there are a few questions, and, and folks, feel free to type your questions in the questions box, and we'll, we'll get to them, uh, or as many as we can. Um, there's, there are a few questions coming in from the audience. Uh, first one, have there been any studies to look at NFL levels in blood with concussions or other brain injuries? Yes, and it's a, it's a slightly funny story because the protein Everyone calls it NFL because it's neurofilament light. But one of the first places it was looked at was in the US NFL, right? The National Football League. That's what that stands for, right? <laughs> I think that's right. And um, basically, uh, you do definitely see an increase in neurofilament in blood after head injuries. Um, so boxers who've been in a fight um, the level goes up really dramatically and it takes about six months to go back to normal. In National Football League players who's, um, who, who were very um, active in games, the level went up a load. In those who were on the bench during games, it didn't rise. Um, and the NFL uh, was kind of um, excited about this at first, but then they got a bit less enthusiastic because they're a bit worried about the idea of a blood test that shows which of their players have been injured by the um by the by playing football so the answer is yes it is a pretty good measure of concussion the downside to that it, although it's exciting for people who study concussion the downside is if you're an hd patient who's had lots of head injuries that could um increase your nfl level um, and this is why 
in my definition of a biomarker, I say it could be useful if we are careful because that's the kind of thing that can kind of mess with the um, outcome of biomarker studies. So, um, you know, if, uh, if, you're, if you uh, have another condition that makes your blood pressure go up or down, then that could mess with the results of a clinical trial. And this is another reason why the neurofilament level in one individual person isn't at the moment going to be any use. This is a really a, a, a tool that we can use in large groups of people to help um, design and interpret clinical trials in HG. That's great. That and that kind of answers one of one of the questions from the uh, audience about how this can new observation can reduce the time it takes to prove that things are working in a clinical trial. So I think you kind of right. I mean, I'm happy to expand on that because it's something that I think about a lot, and I kind of it's, it's quite often the last thing I think about before I go to sleep. This kind of future in which we hope that we will have drugs that really work. Um, and how we get those drugs into everyone who needs them as quickly as possible. And I think what we will end up probably doing is seeing people regularly and regularly testing the level of neurofilament. And then when the level rises to a certain point, we don't know what that point is yet because we don't know what the neurofilament level means in the, you know, for the very long term future. But once that level rises, we might then switch to doing lumbar punctures to measure how much Huntington is floating around in the spinal fluid. And then when the level of Huntington protein reaches a certain point, that's when we might start giving these um, drugs by injection to reduce the protein level. And we'll check whether that's worked, A, by measuring whether we've lowered the protein level, but then also B, by looking at the neurofilament level and saying, has, you know, has, this, has this treatment that we've given this person produced meaningful um, uh, help to their neurons? The, the ultimate test, of course, will be, you know, looking at 10 or 20 years ahead whether these drugs actually slow down progression of HD but the the FDA and the other agencies that license drugs have told us that they are more and more open to the idea of using biomarkers like this to accelerate the licensing of drugs so the current Huntington lowering trial is taking place in patients with early symptoms and signs of HD um, but if that drug works it would, you know, we will really urgently want to get it into people who haven't got symptoms yet, um, and we can really only do that within a reasonable time frame by using biomarkers to guide the um, the process. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that that's probably what's going to happen. And I think that the two, what we call biofluid biomarkers, the, the two the two measurements that we do from fluids that we suck out of people, will be neurofilament in blood or CSF plus mutant Huntington in CSF. So, so are there, Ed or Lauren, are there any, Lauren mentioned that you're going to try to, you're currently replicating the work, the observation in the HDCSF study. Is there, besides that, are there any other work that needs to be done to kind of fully validate NFL as a biomarker or HD progression so that we could, you know, the FDA and the EMA and other regulated, regulating uh, agencies will accept this as a, you know, an endpoint in a neuroprotective trial? That's a good question, and I'm afraid it's a bit of an unknown. I mean, the FDA and the EMA have guidelines for how to validate a biomarker. In other words, how to prove that a biomarker has the, uh, the correct properties. You have to do two things, though, you, in parallel. First, you have to prove to the FDA that the actual machine, the measurement platform, works well. In other words, if you measure the same sample every day for five days, you get more or less the same result. And if you freeze the sample and then thaw it out and freeze it and thaw it out, you get the same result. And if you contaminate the sample with blood or, um, you know, uh, paprika or something, you still get the same result. So that's that's sort of validating the assay, that's validating the um, measurement platform. But the other thing you have to do is validate it clinically. And actually, we've by doing this work, we've we've gone a long way towards that. You know, we've really shown in a very large sample set that this. Um, that this protein in blood predicts many different features of HD that most people would agree are important to be able to predict. The big unknown is whether, well, two big unknowns. Number one, does a drug that works reduce neurofilament level? And number two, does reducing the neurofilament level predict clinical benefit? And as it stands, we, the FDA won't license any drug on the basis of a biomarker alone. You need a, 
the, as a first step, you're going to need to show that the drug produces clinical benefit. The next step, which I think we probably can do, and it may be HD that pioneers this, would be would be then licensing the drug in pre-HD on the basis of the relationship we've seen in patients with symptoms between neurofilament and subsequent clinical improvement. Um, this is a really a conversation that needs to be had. And actually, you know, the good thing is that the, the companies that are running these trials are already deep in discussions with the FDA. Um, at some point, there will probably be a public consultation, and I'm guessing that the HDSA will probably be heavily involved in that and, and will probably invite members of HD families to go to the FDA and express their view about, um, really, and to, to explain to the FDA the importance of getting drugs that work into the people who need them. And I'm hoping that that will go reasonably well. They're, they're certainly a lot more open-minded than they used to be, the FDA. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Ed, for that. Um, more questions. You mentioned uh, this Influx Consortium, and I think you threw up there that this is looking at the Kids HD study in Iowa. Do you have any data to suggest there, or point to the levels of NFL in children under 18? Uh, n nothing yet. Um, because that that um, study, which is run by Pegnopoulos, um, involves samples from children and those children have not been tested for HD. Uh, clearly, it's important to be super careful with things like confidentiality and ethics. And so in order to um, make that study happen and to allow the samples to be shipped outside the USA to us in London so that we can measure neurofilament, um, we've, we've, it's been ne necessary to get additional ethics permission from the, um, from the ethics board in Iowa. That has now happened, and I'm pleased to say that we're, we're on the brink of receiving those samples. But as, as of yet, we haven't measured any uh, measured neurofilament in any of those samples, but it's something that we're really excited to do. It's not going to mean that those kids are any different from how we we knew them to be already. But what we hope is that it will it will, you know, if we find increased neurofilament very very early in in people who have the HD mutation, what that what that raises in my mind and in my heart is the possibility of treating people super early in order to dramatically push back the age of onset. Of it's age. important to remember as well, this is probably going to be the first study that looks at NFL at all in in, in children that young yeah. or anyone. <laughs> so it's a whole new territory that I don't, uh, there's a very good chance that it might be undetectable or there, you right. kind of hope that there's nothing there because your cells are supposed to be getting be developing and not dying at that stage. It's only when you hit what, 21 and everything goes downhill. Right. <laughs> And this is people who don't have the mutation, by the way. This is it's just normal. from the age of about 21. At the end of this webinar, you'll all have <laughs> millions fewer brain cells than you had at the start. I'm sorry to break that to you, but it's true. It's also true of me and Lauren, by the way. That's why you but, can uh, measure NFL and healthy individuals, yeah, exactly. and even in the blood of of completely healthy yeah. people. So, so we just like and that's a really important point. And there's also some link between the Huntington protein, both the healthy form and the harmful form, and the development of the brain. So we know that the Huntington protein is important for the development of the brain. And so what that what that means for neurofilament in kids, I don't even I don't even I literally can't even, <laughs> as the kids themselves would say. I think more I think more interesting probably for the impact HD will be HDAs. It'll be that that's a study where we're looking at 18 to, to 35 or 40 individuals with completely age matched and really um, robust data on um, that whole range of people. Um, with um, controls at the, um, to match that, so we'll hopefully see what what is the tipping scale. What, what's the earliest stage that 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 HD people that carry the gene start rising above what's normal and controls? What was that study called? Sorry, I don't think you said it properly. Yes. Thank you. That's better. <laughs> Got her trained over there, Ed. So we're getting there. <laughs> Even micromanager. Um, <laughs> are there? So there are a few more questions. Uh, I know we're running a little low, late on time, but I want to make sure I get as many as, as, as we can. Um, you showed some correlations of NFL levels uh, to some clinical readouts in the track HD study. There's a question here. Were there any correlations with Q motor measures in the track study? With That's NFL a good levels? question. And the answer is we didn't look. And the reason for that is that there's a kind of rule of statistics 
that if you look, if you ask too many questions, sooner or later, you'll get answers you can't trust. It's kind of like if, you, if, you've, uh, if you're playing pool and you say in advance, I'm gonna hit the cue ball, this is gonna go dramatically off the rails because I don't really know pool, but if you say I'm gonna hit the white ball and then it's gonna hit the red ball and it's gonna bounce off four pockets, four cushions, and then go into the pocket, it's really cool if you say in advance that you're gonna do it, but if you only, if you just hit the ball and then, and then something cool happens and then afterwards you say, oh yeah, I totally meant to do that, it's much less cool. So going into this experiment where we measured neurofilament, what we did was we, we wrote down in advance, kind of in a sealed um, envelope, like these are, the, these are the measurements we think are most likely to be linked to neurofilament. However, um, we're only gonna look at this small number. And this was almost all of them. And certainly with the imaging ones, every single one that we said in advance we were interested in did change with neurofilament. Um, we deliberately didn't look at Q-motor. That's and so for those who may not know, Q-motor is these is kind of automated ways of measuring movement problems in HD, like a machine that measures career or a machine that measures tremor. And um, the, the one reason for that was simply to reduce the number of comparisons, the number of statistical tests that we did, so re reduce the number of questions that we asked. And the other was that basically all of the previous papers from Track HD had shown that Actually, the Q motor was only about as reliable or possibly less reliable than the traditional old fashioned UHDRS score that is the one where you walk up and down the tightrope and you, you know, you do the fist edge flat thing with your hand. So um, for that reason, we kind of deliberately put Q motor on the back burner. But I think it would be certainly interesting to look in the data set and, and, um, and see, you know, looking back whether we did see any association. Great. Um, this is a good question because I've been meaning to ask you. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, as HD Clarity um, new sites become available in the United States, they're all going to be information on those are all going to be available on HD Trial Finder, um, where folks can find information about it. But are there? The question is: Is there any kind of printed information about the Clarity study that you can um, share? That's a good question. If you um, the there is, but it's all in London. <laughs> but if you go to hdclarity.net, um, there on the left, I think there's a link that says something like study documents, and you can look at the whole protocol, which is like the, the very sort of detailed scientific description, but you can also download the patient information sheets, um, and there's some PowerPoint presentations there in PDF form. So um, if you want to hold them in your hand, you could print them off at home. <laughs> But it's all there. It's a, it's kind of a totally, as far as I'm concerned, a totally open access study. I'm all for I'm a um, I'm I'm all for open access science. Thanks, Ed. Um, are you aware of any? Another question is if you're aware of any other uh, neurologic disease clinical trials that have incorporated NFL measurements into the study yeah. design. Um, that, so MS in blood is a relative newcomer, so it hasn't really been designed into any trials sort of in advance that I know about, but the data that I showed, ooh, the data that I showed um, from multiple sclerosis is I think a taste of things to come. So that was this trial in which people had either no treatment or this drug called Fingolimod, which works in MS, and a year later, the ones who had the drug, um, the level fell. Now that was not the neuro, in measuring neurofilament wasn't part of that trial, but they just collected blood samples and then later on someone had the idea of measuring it in that trial. There's just been a trial published like two weeks ago in the journal Neurology where in a, it was a similar kind of real world type thing, but basically they looked at neurofilament levels before treatment and then after treatment with either the first generation or the second generation of MS drugs. And they basically showed that when people went from untreated to treated, the level fell, and then when people from went from first generation to second generation drug, the level fell. Um, and so really, so all of the data we have from clinical trials is looking super promising. Now in neurodegeneration, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, we've never had a drug that works. And so this is a bit of a problem. Um, you could measure neurofilament in all of the Alzheimer's trials that have happened, but because those trials essentially it turned out that the drug probably didn't work, at least in the trial. 
uh, we wouldn't expect the neurofilament level to fall. So what we're waiting for really is the first drug that comes along in neurodegeneration that actually works. Um, a prime candidate actually might be this disease called spinal muscular atrophy, where a drug, an ASO drug, a bit like our gene science testing, um, was, was tried in children with this disease called spinal muscular atrophy. That drug worked and it's now licensed. And I bet you somewhere there's someone um, working away in a lab to measure the neurofilament levels in the kids who were, who were treated with that drug. And I bet it will go down. Yep. Thanks, Ed. Um, I think one, one last time for one last question uh, from the audience. If somebody wanted to know their filament, neurofilament levels in their blood, could they actually request those in that test to be done? And even if they could, I'm going to add this question, yeah. should they? Well, um, they can't, so it doesn't matter whether they should. But I also think that they shouldn't um, <laughs> right now. I mean, this this the, the neurofilaments are, is is new across neurology. But you know, there are blood tests like CRP or prostate PSA for prostate cancer, which were new when they first came out. And the scientists were saying things like I'm saying now, which is this is new. It's only done for research. It's only meaningful in large groups of people. Eventually, those did. You know, a lot of work was put in to get the measurement techniques as accurate as possible and then to roll out clinical testing. Neurofilament might end up being in that category, but it's definitely not there yet. It is, it's, it's already in a position where it can be useful for clinical trials, but um, there's only maybe three or four places in the world where it's measured, and it's really only measured in large groups of people for research purposes. But even if you could get your neurofilament number, because there's a lot of overlap, I'll, I'll flip back to the, um, the main um, graph of results. There's, like, if you, if you look at the difference between controls and early HD, the, the yellow box doesn't overlap much with the gray box, but actually there are, there are plenty of people um, down here who have Huntington's disease mutations, who are well within the control range. And even up here, there are controls right up here. In fact, the highest neurofilament result, result we saw was this guy up here, whose level was higher than any that we saw in HD. This is probably a guy who banged his head against a brick wall or something. So we just don't know. The level in an individual is not gonna be helpful. Plus you can't get it done anyway. But please wait, <laughs> watch this space. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. Well, so we, we are a few minutes past time. I, I, I think we've answered most of the questions that were, were asked. I apologize if we missed any, but um, I want to thank you, Ed and Lauren, for taking the time out of your day to present the, the exciting research to the community. I think it's something they'll be hearing a lot more about in the, in the coming years. Uh, particularly as they hopefully they get involved in clinical studies. Uh, and thank you, Leora, for joining us as well. Um, so that will conclude thank our you. webinar series or, or for this month. Uh, stay tuned um, as we schedule some more. Uh, you'll be sure to hear about them and uh, hopefully you'll join us then. Thanks again, everyone, and talk Thanks to you. Thanks very Bye. much. Bye. Bye.